right? Yes. I heard that After that meeting, Black couldn't get rid of me. Once I went on that side, I stayed there, changed my lens and looked at everything through Black eyes. Mm. Can you speak to some of the people that influenced you around that time? You mentioned one of the um, one of our attendees, Eugenia Collier. Yes. If you want to talk about her and some other people um, that began to inspire you, continue to open open your your mind at that time. She was very tolerant <laughs> because I was very. Uh, I know. I know. I know. And uh, she tolerated that. She tolerated my absences, okay? I turned my work in, I did things as I was supposed to. I did not realize at the time who I was dealing with and the caliber of person that she was, okay? Also around that time, like I said, I was just reading like crazy because it, so many questions were coming to me and I wound up with a job in a library. So books, come through the library on their way to other libraries. I was always reading, even if I had the book under the desk, even if I ran into the bathroom for a couple of minutes to finish off a chapter, I was just always reading because I couldn't stop those books and keep them. So it's like you read as much as you can as it goes sliding by. People, uh, Amiri Baraka, I discovered his poetry roundabout then. And he is still my number one. I thought his politics in a few years later were crazy sometimes and still in poetry, he was my number one, okay? He gave me permission to say anything I wanted to say, tell as much truth as I wanted to tell and then say it any way I wanted to say it and not worry about what people were gonna do about it. So he taught me well. Other people, Paul Coates had a bookstore. I may be juggling with the years, but um, anybody that was selling black books, I was hanging around the bookstore. That's where you meet people. That's where you have all these great dialogues. And one time he said to me that he was gonna open a publishing company. He said, and if you, if you, if you, if you wait, I'll publish your work. I waited nine years and he did because I refused to send my work to white people. I didn't trust them. Mm -hmm. They already showed me and they had shown me they could not be trusted. How so? Um, I recorded an album in 1971 called Black Ivory, poetry to music. I was excited, but I wasn't, I, I wasn't knocked out by the experience because for a poet, you wanted a book. No poets were doing albums. What did an album mean to me? Album didn't mean anything. It wasn't a book. All my life, I was walking towards that book that I wanted to have done. So even several years after the album had been done, it took me about five or six years to realize that I was published, that that actually meant something, okay? Something valid. So the record company burned me, of course. Um, from then on, wherever I went to do uh, public readings, I told people not to buy from them. And it didn't take too long before the company crashed with my blessings. So I know that album reached uh, number 29 on the Billboard 100 list. How did you perceive that? What did you think of it? Yeah, it wasn't a book. I mean, oh, it's as if I wasn't, how do I say this? Like I was just sitting in a corner watching and all of that part of my life was just walking right on by, you know, and I was still waiting for that precious thing that I wanted. I wanted that book. I only signed to do the album because they promised to publish the book. So none of that ever got done. So let me ask you this question. Why did you start writing? And do you remember your first poem? No, I can't remember the first poem. The first writing was short stories. Uh, I think I was 13. I saw a stupid little movie and 
I decided to write a story like the movie, but write it for black people. Okay. And uh, somebody told me they liked it. So I wrote another one. And then I just got into the habit of doing it. It seemed to be easier to express the deepest feelings in writing than in conversation with people. Because sometimes in conversation, I didn't have the heart to say the things I was really feeling. And I didn't want anyone to dislike what I was saying or reject what I was saying. Once you wrote it down and handed it to somebody, that was in. You didn't have to see them again. You didn't have to think about it again. So basically, that's where the writing jumped in. And something you, you said sparked, uh, piqued my curiosity. You said you wrote, a, you saw a story or a movie and you decided to write it from a black perspective. What made you conscious of that at that age, around 13? So we're talking about what, early 60s? Yeah. Just that there were no black people in the movie and I liked it. So, and the fact that I liked it to me meant that there should have been black people in the movie and that black people had those same kinds of experiences. So it was like, let me use somebody in the neighborhood and write about so-and-so, you know, as a spinoff of the story that I saw, you know. I can't even remember what happened to it. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Well, before we get into your into some of your poems, I started off sharing with everyone this new year and the power of the word. In your experiences writing poetry, what can you say about the power of the word? It what is divine. To you? It is divine. And I'm trying to be more respectful of that because I have not always wielded it in a divine fashion, okay? And even as I say that though, when I say it's divine, I still mean that I can say anything that's true, anything, as long as it's true. Okay. So speaking of truth, so for those who may not know, Laini Mataka does have a Facebook page and we are Facebook friends. And she has some wonderful posts on Facebook. I swear reading your posts, if you were to put them together, it's like a book in and of itself. And I, I shared that I was going to speak to some of your posts and just ask you to talk a little bit about it. So you talked about truth. One of your posts on January 4th, you said, the truth asked me, how come everybody gets to go viral but her? What's your answer to that? Everybody's not interested in the truth. Everybody can't afford to hear the truth. Everybody's not built for the truth. So whether I like that or not, okay? I wish we could all tune into it, but that's not gonna happen. Okay. Mm. Yes, yes, wonderful. Well, Mama Laini, we are gonna now turn it over to you. I wanted us to have some context to know who you are for those who may be new to you. And um, I'm gonna now go quiet and listen to your divine powerful words of power. Thank you. I'm reading from Restoring the Queen. The poem is entitled Murder. Tell me, my sister, have you committed murder lately? Have you swallowed poison, lost your mind, and kept a child from its father lately? Have you put yourself first by bad-mouthing someone you know you used to die for his touch? Have you become hard and bitter and ugly because you felt compelled to murder the memory of a man whose love you could not keep? Have you murdered your son lately? Have you taken his future as a man and tied it to the railroad tracks because his father failed to love you back forever? Have you robbed your daughter of a positive, positive relationship with the first man she ever knew? Have you killed her desire to love a man by recounting war stories that still have you shocked beyond belief. Have you murdered anyone lately? 
Have you drawn and courted anyone lately? Not because they couldn't pay child support, but because they left you for higher heights. Not because they now whisper promises in a new ear, but because no one whispers anything in your ear. Have you kept a child away from its father lately? Not because the father was a junkie, a rapist, a child molester, a basher, a walking, talking horror, but because you want to hurt him because you can't find any place to dispose of your pain. Have you put your child's life and future development in jeopardy because you get you cannot get past your own pain? Do I have to ask you again? Have you committed murder lately? Have you kept a black man away from his child? From the same book, Where the bitchery ends, sisterhood begins. Don't roll your eyes at me. You don't even know me. And if something evil were to jump off right now, I might be the only one willing to help you. Don't stand in the corner whispering about me. If you wanna know something about me, ask me. The fact that I don't work my thing the way you do doesn't mean you have the right to hold me in contempt. My name is not bitch, tramp, or slut. And if you don't want your man to communicate with me, then keep him home. But don't get mad with me for being polite enough to be dialoguing with him, even though I am not one of your chosen few. Just because you and I don't gel doesn't mean that you should turn your kitty cat friends against me too. How can my anguish possibly make you feel good? You and I aren't strangers. We used to rule the world together. We fought and escaped slavery together. We cut each other's cords and gave birth together. We cut the ropes and buried the lynch together. We've rescued each other from crazy men and licked our wounds together. We've rejoiced in the coming of men and wept at their departures. And no matter how grossed out life appeared, we handled it together. So why are you acting now like you don't know me? Why are you looking at me out of the corner of your eyes, trying not to see my pain, my situation, my oppression? Why are you trying to act like your life is all right, but I'm the one with the problems? Why are you acting like you've got more in common with Miss Anne than me? Why are you trying to deny that part of you that is also me? Think about it. When men are not involved, we are seldom at odds. Again, when men are not involved, we are seldom at odds. Think about it. We blossom from the same stems and treat each other like poison ivy instead of African violets. Think about it. The core of all of our afflictions is whiter than the blood that is black like we. Returning to the source doesn't mean you have to wear your hair like mine or dress like me or think and act like me. Why waste time on our differences when we could be basking in our similarities? From the beginning of any time that mattered, we have worked our hips throughout history, conceiving civilization after civilization while giving the black man something voluptuous to hold. We have moaned on our thrones, sang in huts, cried in chains, laughed in the fields, and screamed in technicolor, the ultimate tale of our love for our men. And as we now face an overwhelmingly brutal hour, let us use our Beulah May and Zynga powers to celebrate our love for one another. Let this be the day that we burn bitchery and invoke sisterhood from its ashes. Let's start embracing each other and mean it. Let's ask sincerely about each other and mean it. Let's listen to each other and mean it. Let's comfort each other and mean it. Let's respect each other and mean it. Let's join our kings and queen it. Woo, mama, okay, yes. You see how we are starting this year off with the power of the word. If you did not just bring the fire, Mama Laini, as you see in the chat, oh my gosh, the fire emojis, the heart emojis are coming through. So the bitchery, the need for sisterhood, the need to respect our children, the fathers of our children. How do we heal? Not in a sentence, that's for sure. Self-love is probably the first thing we need to step to because once we do that one and get that correct, there will be this overflow of love for our own people. 
and those who remind us of ourselves. Okay. It's very difficult because we're living in an age of globalization where the trashiest images and stories about us are taken all over the world and people see and think about us in those negative ways when it's not true. Sometimes yes, but not true as an entire people. So it's a very difficult thing to do. And I say, start, on, start with children. If you can get the children to care about themselves, to be happy about themselves, to be glad about being black, we can take it from there. Yes. So do you want to speak a little bit about those two poems that you shared? The poem about the women, I've noticed too often that if sisters are out somewhere together and fine, enjoying each other, and a man enters into that space, everything changes. Everything changes. This is just most of the time. I know it's a generalization. And um, I know sisters who go into a different voice, body posture, eyes, everything, because a man approached, okay? I don't really have a problem with that, except be yourself. Be your own lovable self, okay? And women can't fight over men. No, I'll clean that up. Women don't fight over men. They fight over their perceptions. Does that make sense? What, what are those perceptions? You fight over what you think he is. Okay? And not always who he genuinely is. All right? Fantasy, perhaps? You're also fighting over a situation that you cannot control. Mm -hmm. If it's a fight between two women over a man, that man can walk off with a third woman and leave the both of y'all standing there looking stupid, okay? So I think this whole sisterhood thing needs to get so much tighter, okay? I'm very pleased and proud of women in my era, all right, who still have friends from 40, 50, 60 years ago. And what I'm seeing in young women tells me that they may not have the benefits of those kind of relationships because they don't know how. So speaking of relationships, why do you think women um, and even black men and women don't have um, those always loving relationships? Today, um, I find that there's a lot of I think created tension between black men and black women. Mm -hmm. And when you spoke about um, the child, the woman keeping the child from the father mm -hmm. and the, the real reason behind that at the core being relationships between black men and black women and how they relate and how that impacts the family and future generations. Um, how do we begin to heal our relationships with each other? What's at the core of the dysfunction? And what do you think? Self-love is one of the things that you mentioned. What else can we do to help restore the Black family as man, woman, and child? I'm going to quote Mr. Neely Fuller. If you don't understand racism, white supremacy, what it is and how it works, then everything you think you know will only confuse you, okay? Our relationships are socially engineered. We think we're the ones doing the doing, but we're not, okay? Um, this society and who is, who's ever at the top of this society, those are the puppet masters. We're the puppets, okay? When the puppets act ugly, it's not the puppets that are acting ugly. The ones controlling the strings are the ones that make us act ugly. We have to treat ourselves like um, stolen territory and get it back. Like when you change your name or correct your name from an English name, you're getting it back. You're taking control and trying to 
reverse some of the damage and get some of the healing done that we need so much. Little by little, we have to get rid of the Europeanisms in us and replace them with genuine Africanisms and not white stuff painted black. Awesome, thank you. Okay, we can continue on with your next set. I couldn't not say something about Gaza. This is a, I'm reading from the Prince of Kokomo and the poem is called Intifada. When evil turns out not to be amphibian, but instead, Where's Armani and looks like the boy next door? It must be hunted down like a rabid dog by a posse carrying torches or a circle of hearts carrying virtuosity. When evil is imperceptible among humans and beings of light are forced to use darkness to cloak their might, when evil seems to be without obstacle and moves with the ferocity of a forest fire, we must all dive deep into our God selves and raise the stakes a little bit higher. The fight against evil is never beyond reach. Angels are muscle in the arms of the righteous. As soon as evil steps into your awareness, attack it. If it tries to overpower you, beat and kick on it. If it gets you in its embrace, break its skull with your forehead. If it gets a grip on you, bite it. If it shrugs off your teeth, spit on it. Don't wait till it shows up at a theater near you. As soon as rumors of evil threaten your ears as a part of the living God, it is your moral obligation to study that evil like a scientist in a biological warfare center. And then tell everybody you know at least twice. Tell it until you can run it in your sleep. Tell it until it rings like a mantra. Tell it until they put a bounty on your tongue. When the place where your dreams meet forces one eye to remain open, when evil has ID'd you and has you sneaking around corners and wearing dark glasses, resistance respects the right to flee. The truth will be better off crossing a border in your breast pocket than ground into a powder by the boots that seek to stomp you to death. There are so many bunkers on the battlefield and no honor is lost in the pursuit of a better one. But when flight like a possibility has been shot down, and fortune cements your feet to the present, where evil claims every space, including the one you occupy, resist. Not because that's all that's left to do, but because it's the most that can be done. Resist with every God cell in you. Even if your body is bound, even if your mouth is gagged, even if your eyes are blindfolded, resist with the totality of your being. Shoot nuclear spears from the purity of your heart and bring evil down to its knees. Progress. Progress is not progress that leads people to level nine before they're aware of level eight. Unless it makes people better in some way that doesn't hurt them and the environment, it's regress and ought to be followed by egress. Straight up. If white people just flat out admitted to being devils, Guess how many Negroes will be gluing on horns and sewing on tails? Communion. Cortez told the Aztecs they must give up their idols and abstain from human sacrifices. Instead, they must drink the blood of Christ and eat the flesh of Jesus. This is a confession. When I was young, I was too chicken to be a Black Panther. Being cats, I thought they would eat me. I'm gonna read from the new book. Okay, before you get to the new book. Go ahead. Um, just lo love it. I, I love the, the horns. Um, the one about the devil on the horns, I, I think we see manifestations of that. You go on social media, I, I think you, you, you can see that quite literally. 
um, even with some of the artists that are out, your first poem that you just read on that set, one was Gaza, and you talked about resisting. Can you speak to the influence of ancestral rhythms in your poetry? When you speak, Mama Laini, I always get this sense of just this warrior queen, ancient wisdom, knowledge, like you just pull down, it's like you're just, you're tuned into this knowledge and it just comes through you. And you, you sew words together so beautifully. And it's like, you're able to capture all these different ideas that in my mind, at least they're all rumbling up there, but you just, you, you capture them. You create this quilt with your, with your words. Can you speak to the ancestral connection in your writing? I didn't always know what to call it. The first thing I ever thought of was uh, Muse, because that was the only reference I'd ever heard for something like that. And um, it's still valid. All I can tell you is when I have something I want to write, I sit down, I sit in front of the computer, and then I wait. And then it comes. I don't have to go after it. I don't have to ask for it, seek it out, pray for it. Whenever I sit down in that position, it's as if they're all watching, they're all listening, and they go, okay, now. They talk so much, I don't sleep well. They talk all night long, and I'm still trying to find ways to deal with that. Okay. The power of the word, There's almost no English to describe that, okay? Because the word here is a lie and that's all it ever is, okay? There's a Igbo proverb that says, if you wanna tell a lie, speak English. And that's a fact. So while we're listening to them lie on the outside and we're listening to other very familiar and loving voices on the inside. If we don't know that's what we're listening to, we could very easily think we're sick. We can very easily think we have mental problems. If we have never had anybody explain that to us or refer to it or heard of it in any way, we will think that something is wrong with us. And there, there's nothing wrong with us because we can judge how sane we are by how African we are. I hope that was my answer. Oh, that was that 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 is it. That is it. Okay. okay. All right. So you're speaking, you're talking now from your new book. Can you share, can you show us your new book? Yes. So for those who are asking about getting Laini Mataka's books, you can go to blackclassicbooks.com. I will also be sharing with you all um, a flyer for a special sale price for her new book. Okay. This is, this is my girl of all times. The Queen of Soul for Aretha Franklin. My parents told me about drugs, liquor, and sex. But when my preteen fingers placed a needle on my first Aretha album, I became hooked on a sound more addictive than any drug I would ever take. When her voice fanned out into my sensibilities, my understanding of the world was yanked out of childhood and right into adulthood. Pains that had no antecedents, aches that arrived before my first real drama. I learned the meaning of the blues without toting a barge or lifting a bell. When she cried over him, I was the one who got the headache. When she begged him to do right, I was the one on my knees praying. When she reached out to the loveless, I was the one who reached back. 
When she poured her heart out to the world, I was the vessel that caught her every drop. And when she praised God, I was the one who possessed. I've sailed the river of Aretha for decades, sometimes spying on her life between the lyrics, searching for her eyes among the tabloid rumors, feeling blindly for her hand when my sinking meshed with her singing. She was the something I called on when life fell like plaster on my head. Her songs were my lifeline from preteen to menopause. She was the auntie who soothed what everybody else tried to tip around. She made me sing around the house with an abandonment that thrilled my soul and made my family go, what? The more other people said I sounded like her, the stronger I threw my head back and wailed. Even after I was grown, I never outgrew Aretha because Aretha never stood still. Her excellence shifted from genre to genre, from finger popping to mind blowing, from soul shaking to love making, from precious Lord to take my hand. There was no combination of sounds that she couldn't infuse with her own brand of humanity. No musical medley that she couldn't master and spit out anew. Riri was my confidant. Under the cover of her voice, I admitted things to myself that I'd never breathed to another soul. She made me feel like her favorite, even though I knew I was another unknown. As long as she was around, no part of my emotional self ever went hungry. She was a mecca for black women who gathered together to unleash their love for their men. She was our ambassador to our own brethren. The things they didn't want to hear from us, they listened to it when Aretha came singing it. She was an unchained force when it came to battling for the love, tenderness, and devotion of our kings. No other ebony diva's lifetime's work has laid the groundwork for a more perfect understanding of how sisters feel about brothers. Aretha was a living, breathing musical treasure. Her entire career was a mosaic of black life and struggle. They called her the queen of soul, but queens die and Aretha is forever. I know we have heard this little phrase so often it kind of got on my nerves. So I finally had to do a little something about it. It's called rescue me. If I understand you correctly, you ain't gonna lift a finger to help, not a hand to pray, because as you claim, God got this, as opposed to what? Does that mean you can float around in a pseudo spiritual stupor, feet barely touching the ground, proudly abstaining from the news and those current events that shape your life, because God got this? So we don't need to worry that the world is testing the waters again to see how many of us can be auctioned off without repercussions. And slavery couldn't possibly reoccur because God got this, right? Is that how you justify being an observer instead of a participant in the battle to keep the police from pouring libations with our children's blood? I know God got this, but when are you going to get it? This is about a young man and his baby mama. It's called her type. She was his son's mother and no one was allowed to spit out her name. Not his mother who warned him in perpetuity about her type. Not his father who claimed to know all about her and her type. Not his sister who never met her but was eager to speculate about her type. Not his homeboy whose behinds he had to kick for denigrating her type. He already knew what type she was. She was his son's mother. Guilty. All a black man has to do to be charged with the attempted murder of a white girl is to stop and look at her which will leave her breathless and him guilty as charged. That kind of woman. I come from a long line of women wanted for the wrong reasons. Instead of dolls, we were given fear to cut our teeth on. Something was always lurking. There were always reasons not to be as pretty as we really were always restraints on how much of our womanhood we were allowed to act out. 
To saunter along was to be lascivious. To be caught enjoying the moment was downright nasty. I come from a long line of women wanted for being inaccessible. Our breasts and our heads sit up too straight. We never tease and only appease when it pleases our souls. Men visit our dreams until they become too heavy for the scenes to hold. They go from perplexed to vexed and back again when they can't find our control buttons. They freak out and accuse us of pissing in their tea. I come from a long line of women wanted for their sultriness. Everything we do naturally is considered sinful. The way we have smile or make a man's eyes bulge out of his head is now considered a crime. When fabric flows like water over our behinds, it's a felony. Every time we stare a man down to F or flight, a warrant is issued for our immediate arrest. I come from a long line of women that's getting shorter every day. This is a tribute to my uncles. And I hope every woman has a man in her life like this. In defense of my virtue, he said he wanted me. And if I didn't give it up, he would take it. My 14 years of living didn't know what to do with that. So every time I left my house, I was creeping and sniffing for the slightest hint of him, ready to go the distance with flight because I knew I couldn't fight him and win. I only told one of my boys in the hood, the one I often revealed my heart to. I wasn't asking him to fight for me, just be aware with me. He said he wanted me. And if I didn't give it up, and then one day I saw him and he saw me and crossed over to the other side of the street. Eyes empty of desire, but seething with a low grade kind of fear. I didn't even get a chance to be afraid. I couldn't wait to tell my boy in the hood, but his news was even wilder than mine. He said he saw my uncle and the dude who thought he wanted me so much in the alley on his knees with my uncle's 38 in his mouth. Truth be told, I was living in a house full of uncles who would die before they tipped into my bedroom and kill before letting anybody break into my holy of holies. You want a little break? Yes, yes. I, you felt that. You were, yes. I think we all need a moment just to kind of let that resonate. That's so powerful. It, it's a wonderful story of Black manhood, of Black men, our protectors, Black men who love us. And that's who they are. That's who Black men are. They're wonderful. They are our kings. They love us. They are protectors and they are providers. And that poem is such a beautiful display of, of that. Thank you. Question? That, huh. There's a, a Facebook post, another one of your posts. Okay, go ahead. Made, mm -hmm, you said, some of y'all still waiting for the elevator <laughs> to break down when you should have gone crazy a long time ago. Your uncle always didn't love that song. To break down. I always love that song, and I always think I don't know why I think everybody heard Prince and everybody knows that song. Therefore, everybody knows what I'm referring to. But he talks about. He says, "When the elevator breaks down, let's go crazy." I'm a quote a friend of mine who said, "We always wait for it to start raining before we decide we want to build a fire." The moment is always now. Whatever thing, whatever we think we're fighting, whatever we think we're trying to go after, whatever we bring in with us, the moment is always now. You may not be able to do the whole thing all at one time, then you do it in increments, okay? We don't have to wait for any perfect time because there isn't any, it's right now because we should have gone crazy on them a long time ago. <laughs> I say. Uh, Shay, I think we all hear that. Um, speaking of the time being now, here's some advice from Mom Laini. You said, consider something you've been yearning for, but have not been able to get and have therefore put away up on a shelf. Today, 
take it back down, fill it, and surround it with prayer and the might of your ashe and go after it again. I think the concept of ashe is absolutely wonderful, okay? The power to bring something into existence, okay? And to know that each one of us has that. A child can work their ashe, okay? This isn't something where you have to have a high IQ and have to have some degrees or read certain kinds of books, okay? If you feel strong enough inside of yourself, you can make your ashe bring you what you need. Do I ultimately believe that? Ultimately, I do. I might not believe it tomorrow when I need a couple of dollars to do such and such and such and such a thing, but I always keep coming back to it. I keep coming back to it and hope that I'm getting better with it every day. And for those who don't know, can you explain what ashe is? It's your, in a prayer, when you lay out a prayer and then say, Ashe, so be it, basically. Let it be done, okay? But that's not just in prayers. It's in anything you ask for, anytime you approach it with your Ashe. You got some, if we're God's children, then we're not rabbits, okay? If we're God's children, then we're God's, okay? And that part of God that is also us, what God can work, we can work. We just don't believe that right now, but I really do. Yes, yet we see it in fruition. We see it because the word creates the reality. So it, it happens whether we're conscious of it or not. It does. So speaking of the word, and bringing things into fruition. Um, you came up in the 60s, the 70s, uh, around the time of the birth of hip hop. A, an element of, of, bring, of speaking, of speaking and, and word power. I'm curious as to your thoughts of hip hop music in these last 50 years. Well, number one, I never liked the name. Okay. I didn't see any significance in that at all. I mean, a bunny can hip hop, a rabbit can hip hop, okay? I really couldn't see the significance. And the reason why, oh, another reason I didn't want it to be labeled as such, it's part of a continuum. And I didn't want it to be pulled out of that, which is exactly what happened, okay? It's as if, when jazz and rhythm and blues were talking about what happened to them, hip hop wasn't listening, okay? They took it out of our hands and then did what they wanted to do to it, okay? In that beginning, yes, I liked it. In the beginning, yes, I was singing along, okay? And I didn't feel like it was different from any other music we had. And then it started to get a little more distant and, uh, a little more uh, customized, but not to anything useful or positive. So what I can say about hip hop is that it made some of the most unaware people millionaires and billionaires. Okay. And I don't see that money coming back to the community. Good point, good point. How do we how do we recapture the minds of our youth with social media and what the youth are facing in today's society? We don't have to always go to the record companies. Okay. Ujama, Kuji Chagalia, bring those things into reality. All right. We can make small things. It doesn't always have to be um, sell 50 million copies, okay? We know what the music does to them by how they act. We hear it and then we look at them and see how they act. So if we were saying beautiful things to them, if we were talking about, let me say this, 
I always had problems with low self-esteem. The thing that helped me to stop that or, or to raise it, black history. The more I read, the fuller I got, the deeper I got, the more wonderful I became to my own self. So if we know that music does this, all of our lyrics should be great. Put it on music that would that they would become absolutely addicted to, but don't have them around here and this and this and this to garbage. Let all of that lead to constructive work, to feeling better about yourself, to feeling better about the community and wanting to do more for the community. Otherwise, whew, we're gonna keep going around in the circle that we're in right now. And that is not healthy. So let me ask you this question. When you first got started writing your poetry, did you find that the white publishing company sought to control your voice? The only experience I had with them was with the album. And after that, I never sent anything to them. Okay, because I was waiting on Paul Coates. Why was that so special? Because Paul was never gonna say to me, you can't say that about white people. Paul was never gonna go, oh, no, no, Lainey, that sound kind of hateful. Don't, no, don't, don't, don't say that, don't say that. Just say they not nice people. He would never do that to me. He has never edited my work for anything except maybe spelling or something, but never to change the gist of my politics ever. So yes, I stayed with him, <laughs> you know, year after year after year. Yeah. Yes, that's a, that's a very powerful message and lesson for many people to learn because as you were saying, hip hop did begin to change and the message that was put out did begin to get influenced by record companies and those, those people who are really controlling the industry. So I'm happy to hear you share that even in publishing your own poetry, there was an attempt to, to, I guess, edit what you had to say, but you didn't allow that to happen. So thank you for being that lesson and standing true to your word. And we can continue. Thank you. Yes. More enduring than dreams. He hates that damn job. Been going there five days a week for 15 years, and he feels like a squeezed out tube of toothpaste. It ain't like he's making any real money, but he's got real benefits and four real children. Every now and then, one of his old dreams gets up, shakes itself off, and tries to make a comeback, but fades when asked about benefits. He dreads going to work every day. Been going there five days a week for 15 years. Whatever youth he has left, just wants to sneak out the back door, turn towards the sun and sprint towards happiness. With ease, he sees himself traveling across the country, picking up work, laying down women and never looking back. But he's got four children and the hole his absentee daddy left in him acts like a binding spell that won't allow him to do what his daddy did. So he slams the door on that temptation, makes sure his uniform is clean for the next day, hugs his badass children goodnight, climbs into bed and sleeps with the serenity of a man who's doing the right thing. For all black women, you gotta have a sister, okay? And I don't just mean by blood, you gotta have a sister. If you've ever had a real sister for a friend, then you know a sister will ride shotgun with you or drive the getaway car for you. She'll curse fake friends out if they tell your business and slap your name out of their mouths if they speak with split tongues. A sister will watch your children, let you watch hers, let them watch each other and make them all move over if that's what time and circumstance demand. A sister will feed your kids like she feeds her own and wag her finger in their faces like she does her own. A sister will massage the truth for you if your well-being needs it and then turn around and fillet you like a fish if your survival depends on it. 
She'll lend you money you didn't ask for, buy groceries you never mentioned, being out of, put gas in your car, money on your smart trip card, and take you out to kick up your heels when the children become all you can talk about. A sister will look deep down inside of you, open up the wound, fill it with powdered love, and stitch it back up with laughter. She'll monitor your man as if she was getting paid, check his actions in public, record how many smiles he got and gave, and keep a visual on how many hugs and deliver an accurate account of who was all up in his face. A sister will baby you through heartbreak, prop you up during bankruptcy, stay glued to your side during abandonment, guard your things during an eviction, tell you when you've entered into addiction, set up camp in your room after surgery, hold your hand after an abortion, and sandpaper the edges of your oppression until you can get a smile on your face. A sister will pray with you and over you and for you, sit down and scheme on how to make a way for you and hook you up with anyone she thinks can do anything for you. A sister will stand up for you and to you. She'll even go up against your own family for you and any effort they might make to dismantle you. She never co-signs anybody's right to hurt you. However, a sister can lose her mind for a minute betray your confidence, hurt you more than any man possibly could, and then come back to the scene of the crime, express absolute remorse, and return to her rightful place in your heart, but only if you're a real sister too. I just read recently that the emergency workers who gave the drug to Elijah McLean the young violinist who was killed have been charged and found guilty. I don't know about the sentencing. This is called Like Eagles and it's dedicated to Elijah McLean. Violinists are sacred, like bald eagles, a crime to kill. To the unevolved, they are frightening. Their closeness to angels make virgins shudder. The gossamer sounds that they produce make calcified beings crumble. They are known around the world for coming in many splendid strains, yet they still can't walk down the streets in public without winding up the preferred sacrifice. Along with memorizing concertos, rewriting arias, they must learn to be invisible, to circumnavigate those enclaves full of clogged colons and feral faces. When they are taught to ascend musical scales, somewhere in that rapture where they strain to reach beyond notes not yet heard, space must be made for self-defense. Backed by hours of honing on the range, if they spend too much time in heaven, they'll never survive here on earth. Violinists have the breath and the width of eagles. They are masters of the air with wing spreads that defy measurement. Both are endangered for the same reasons. the beauty of black women. The black woman's beauty is not a metaphor, not some far-fetched theory to be debated by fools, not an illusion to be pierced by diligent occultist, but a fact that fuels the earth's rotation, a reality that holds the sky in perfect repose. The black woman as the center of the earth is not a fevered imagining, hip-shaking mirage or an inflated assertion from the low self-esteemed. It's like the hardcore presence in striated rock, a deep-seated fecundity tattooed on ancient walls by speechless artists who drew pictures of voluptuous women because it was all they knew of God. I have changed the name of what these people are called. They are known as the Scottsboro Boys, but I'm calling them the Scottsboro Scapegoats. They were tried for not wanting the white women on the train, for not salivating at the thought of sinking into that forbidden white flesh, for not giving crackers something to point at and say, see? They were tried for being close enough to breathe the same air as the white girls, for chasing the other crackers off the train, so they could have had the white girls all to themselves, only none of them wanted them. They were tried just as much for not wanting the white women as they would have been if they had. After all, who were they not to fit the description? Who were they not to be the usual suspects? Even when one white girl said it never happened, it didn't matter. Those rednecks didn't need her consent. 
Her truth was as irrelevant as she was. The rednecks got it in their minds, and so it stayed there because they needed it to be there. And they and their forefathers had raped so many black women, they needed to believe that all black men wanted to do the same to theirs. And knowing that a bunch of raggedy ass black males had access to two white females and didn't want them, forced them into a cognitive dissonance that the brothers themselves were made to pay hell for. Their dogged belief in black men as demons blew up right in their faces. So they held them behind bars for years, tried them repeatedly, committed double jeopardy three or four times. They took their gangrenous teeth and bit out whole chunks of their lives, all because they needed a reason to justify punishing the black teens who beat the crackers off of their train and smudged the purity of white women by finding them undesirable. Yes, yes, yes. So Mama Laini, just bringing the fire, bringing the fire. Um, what I would like for us to do now is to take a few questions from the audience um, and then come back and I know you that the special poem that you shared at the um, at the baby shower. Okay, we can close up with that poem. I think we'll be. Okay. And remember that when I was talking about about the black men. This is a short one. I wanted to hit that before we left. Just any time. Oh no, no! Oh no! Perfect. That's perfect. So mm -hmm. feel free to you know we're not done, but I just wanted to uh, give the audience an opportunity to get some of their questions answered. And while that is taking place, I do want to share with everyone a special offer for tonight's attendees for um, the uh, published works of Laini Mataka. So on your screen, you all should see two codes. Um, one code is for, if you already purchased Return of the Kings, then you can get Restoring the Queen, Never as Strangers, Prince of Kokomo, and Being a Strong Black Woman Can Get You Killed for $26. That is a $61 value, but you can get it tonight for $26 if you use the code Kings Classic. That's Kings K-I-N-G-S classic. The other special is to get Return of the Kings plus the books that I just mentioned, Restoring the Queen, Never as Strangers, Prince of Kokomo, and Being a Strong Black Woman Can Get You Killed. That's $45 um, for a $76 value. That code is Kings Full, K-I-N-G-S-F-U-L-L. -L. So if you don't have Return of the Kings, you want to use code Kings Full for $45 to get all of those, um, all five of those works. If you already have Return of the Kings, then you want to get the other four works. And that special code is Kings Classic. So please um, feel free to take a screenshot of the flyer and get your special discount. We are so, again, thankful for you joining us. And we want to thank Brother Paul Coates and Black Classic Press for presenting this special offer for tonight's Wisdom Wednesday attendees. Okay. So um, our Wisdom Wednesday uh, programs are... Um, put on our YouTube page, ikgculturalresourcecenter.com, um, where you can find um, the recording. So for someone, a couple of people asked that question, just want to share that with you. Um, the first question, Mama Laini, someone wanted, wanted to know who was the illustrator of your book? They love the cover. And Sharon wants to know who's the illustrator. Artist Michael Brown. And he has a great deal of work you can pull him up by just saying Michael Brown, artist. And he's also on Facebook. Yes, a wonderful, wonderful uh, artist. Michael Brown is the illustrator of Laini Mataka's new book. 
Arnold asks and says first, thank you. Um, oh, I think I answered that question. How do you obtain a recording? You can go to the IKG YouTube page. Um, Cher J asks, what is your favorite poem of all time? Of someone else's? They didn't specify, so yeah, of someone else's. Whatever it is, Baraka wrote it. <laughs> Whatever it is, Baraka wrote Whatever it. Whatever it is, it. yes, Baraka <laughs> wrote it, yes. Excellent, excellent. Um, Natalie asks, which of your older poems would you rewrite today? Do you ever go back and look over your work? Do you say, hmm, I think I will say this now? That's funny. I could rewrite almost every poem I've ever written. I have actually stood on stage and changed the words while I was reading it and had people thinking they were following me in a book and go, I didn't see that part, what was that part? Because the idea that came was so good, I mm -hmm. had to slide it in there, but I'm always ready to rewrite, always. Wonderful. And Keisha Taifa, welcome for those who may not know. And Keisha Taifa is a, another Wisdom Wednesday uh, speaker. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, she asked, Laini was a right. Laini was contemporaries with Nikki Giovanni, Sonia Sanchez, Jane Cortez, and more. Um, why didn't you get the national acclaim and attention they got? One. I came up younger. I wasn't exactly with them. It's kind of like I was following in their shadow, okay? Two, I know I could have gone much farther. I couldn't just let go of myself. People grab at you too much. They, you know, they pull the energy of having of people pulling off of you. Um, I realized that was a little bit too much for me, okay? And that I did not want to be in that bright, bright, bright light because I didn't think I was strong enough to be able to hold on to myself, to stay, whoever, stay who I was and not change up to start to please other people, you know? I'm a little bit like that still. Okay. Okay. Um, and the follow up on Cher's question about your favorite uh, poem, she uh, also wanted to know yours or others. So you mentioned anything about Baraka. Do you have a favorite poem of your own that you wrote? No. No. Yeah. It only remains a favorite for a, a little while, and then it's like, okay, I'm through with you, you know, <laughs> and then move, <laughs> and then move on to to something else. Okay. Rhonda asks, do you have any advice for young Black poets? Read. Read. History and other people's work. I'm meeting younger people who are writing, and you ask them who's, who's poetry? Nobody's. Uh, there are others out there. <laughs> okay? Read other people's work. You will get um, so much information. You will learn so much about structure. You will see that you have so many options in how you can write, you know, just read other people's work. And if you can find a small circle of people who are willing to write with you, do that because you inspire each other a lot. That can be wonderful. When your energy bounces off of each other like that, that's good and it's great for growth. And tell the truth. Mm, tell the truth. Tell the truth. Did you find, this is me asking you this question. Um, when did you realize that poetry was your place to tell the truth? As opposed to just being- And I realized I was too lazy to keep writing long things. <laughs> okay. Because it was like, mm -hmm. I thought I was going to write enough. I did write a novel. I do have a novel. The novel is in a bag on the. Do y'all hear that? Of my bedroom. 
Do y'all hear that Lana Laini Mataka has a novel that we don't know about, y'all? It. What are we gonna do? I need twenty my about twenty pages so I can finish it. Um, I started it twenty years ago. I'm still waiting for the twenty pages. Uh oh. So we it gotta come to you. Maybe I don't seem to get very excited about it. It seems like I've learned so much since then. I want to go back into the book and go, okay, that ain't true. That's not true. I was wrong about this. I was wrong about that. But okay, I'm more interested in quotes, mm. or aphor aphorisms. Aphorisms, yes. yes. Okay. I'm loving that. Love it. You love it. Okay. Yes. yes. So, um, continuing on, KG Williams asked, what should we as Black concerned men do to help our sisters with the bitchery traits they display amongst each other. Do not be the source that makes them act like that. Mm -hmm. If you notice that kind of behavior, step to them. Okay. You'd be surprised when two women are focusing on one man, he can kind of control that, that entire thing himself by how he treats them, okay? If he treats them both well, to the point where neither one of them is crying or thinking that they're lacking or not getting something that they want, then okay. Mm -hmm. It doesn't usually happen that way because there are not that many people who know how to do that. We can just barely deal with each other one-to-one -one and do that correctly and in a healthy fashion, okay? But when you see one woman wants to fight another woman because you're with that other woman, uh, you might be getting a little flicker of joy inside about that, but don't let that situation overflow. You can stop that if you have the intention. Mm -hmm. So good intentions. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Boko Ia Marie, greetings. Welcome. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, she says a dupe. Um, she wants to know, do you have any scheduled in-person readings? And she loves your rhythmic reading and she loves you. So sending her love. Love you, Black. <laughs> um, not at the moment. I wanted that book to be out in a store, someplace where I could even walk in and get it myself before I would even try to set anything up, okay? But I am doing Kaba's show sometime next month. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, can you tell us um, the station, time? For those who- We haven't picked the day. Okay. We haven't picked the day, but um, what is it? Uh, Ancient Future on WPFW? Comes okay. on Mondays from three to five. Wonderful, wonderful program. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I allow him to host it because that's what a nice person I am. Okay? <laughs> and he says that he is ready to return my show back to me sometime next month for one day only. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. So um, I'm sure you'll post it on your Facebook page. Yes. So if you can go to Laini Mataka on Facebook and send her a friend re request and you can stay updated on any of her upcoming events that way. Um, Tiki is asking how long are the two offers in effect for? I'm not certain, but um, I'm hoping that someone in the audience can let us know how long those the special um, last will last, but don't wait too long do go ahead and submit your orders. And Kichi um, is asking, have you thought about writing a memoir? Uh, not only do I think about writing a memoir, I charge all of us with that. Mm -hmm. I think each one of us should pick one chapter out of our lives and write that down. History is only gonna give us events and, what, uh, and the time that those events happen, but whatever you write, We'll tell people how, how we felt about those events, how we felt in that time period. So if you wrote something about your life and somebody found it 50 years later and they're going, 
whoa, you mean they didn't like that? That's how people responded back then? That's how they really felt? So we are part of history. We're living it. So I think each one of us should write a little something and leave it to a family member or whatever, but just go ahead and leave it and go on to our next station. Awesome. So coming full circle, um, this will be the final question for this portion. Sabrina asks, and Sprecher says, peaceful readings, it your verbal delivery of your poetic historical works of truth is so, so powerful, as well as the words and themes themselves. Have you considered audio recordings of your work? So you started off that way. Have you reconsidered? I'm still thinking about it. It's not, it's not a, a problem of whether or not to do it. Um, I, I prefer that. I like that very, very much. I always like the process. I'm not up with the current technology. So it's like, okay, so you, you, you produce it. Then what? What do you do with it? Mm. I don't know how people are doing that. So if I'm really, really interested, I, I'm going to have to do my homework and find out how I can distribute it because there's no need in doing it if I can't get it out there. Okay, so it, it's the consideration family. And I'm, I'm sure that the family here and, and around the globe will definitely uh, be interested to hear your works as well as read them. Um, so speaking of, I'm going to turn it back over to you. I'm going to do this piece. This was for a young man named Marvin Johnson. And he lives in my neighborhood. Uh, we always saw each other in passing. I was a counselor in a place where he used to come as a child. And <laughs> we were standing there talking. And I was getting to hear him as a grown man instead of that child. And he started talking about spirituality, which pleased me and surprised me so very, very much. Week later, he was shot standing on the corner. This is the poem. Grand larceny. Don't look now, y'all, but we've been robbed. Someone whose brain has been soaking in hatred rolled up into our community and robbed us of someone whose possibilities were endless. When you kill a young black man, you kill everything he was ever meant to be. Not only do you steal his breath, but you strangle all the babies he could have created, all the dreams he was dreaming, all the heights he wanted to reach, you destroy with one touch of your finger. When you uncreate a brother man, you leave a hole in his family the size of the Grand Canyon, a hole that can never be filled, never be closed, and almost never healed. When you blast the life out of a black man, dozens of women are robbed of a possible boyfriend, lover, or husband. Some woman somewhere is stripped of the arms that were holding her, the eyes that were appreciating her, the heart that was loving her. When you pull the trigger on what you think is just a nigger, you destroy the homeboy he was to other black men, the ride or die loyalty that he shared with his closest friends. Every significant thing that he was to other people is deleted. And those who trusted him the most are left to wander around empty handed, stuck in their feelings and wondering why they can't breathe. His whole family is robbed of the wages he was bringing home to keep them out of poverty. Without caring one way or another, you might be robbing some mother or some father of their one and only child, sentencing them to a lifetime of grief and heartbreaking sadness. When you execute a black man, you also kill his chance to be a Nat Turner, a Black Panther, or a Malcolm X. You squash his opportunity to show boys in the community how to be real men. You rob the whole community of his intelligence, his compassion, and possible activism. The heavenly gifts he was given at birth are flushed down the toilet, and the opportunity to be what God created him to be is kicked to the curb like an empty beer can. When you take a black man's life, you rob the whole world of anything he might have invented, any miracles he may have been able to perform, any chance he may have had to make a great race better. Everything he may have felt, anything he may have thought is left on life's highway like roadkill. When you snatch the life out of a black man's body, not only do you rob him of all his possibilities, you rob every person who ever knew him and everybody he was ever supposed to meet. 
And I want you to take that to heart. This is the real nitty gritty. They don't hate you. They're in awe of you, stunned repeatedly by the complexity of you, frustrated by their primitive inability to comprehend the depth of you, ashamed at how short they always come up when compared to you. They don't hate you. They admire you behind closed doors, fantasize about you under the covers, pretend to be you when no one is watching, and pray that one day they awake with perfect bodies just like yours. They don't hate you. It's just that they can't bear to watch you shoot hoops without getting nauseous. They have a hard time containing themselves when they see you run down a field, want to scream in pain when you dance, and wish the ground would swallow them up when you strut. They don't hate you. They just mad because they can't get a hold of your women like you can theirs. Your virility is all of their worst dreams come true. Your sex appeal, even with the volume turned all the way down, can be heard by all the women of the world, while theirs can't be heard, not even with a hearing aid. They don't hate you. They want your sun-kissed skin, your lips, your buttocks, and your good googa mooga. Their lives are ingrained with a savage envy of you. They want to rid the world of you so they can stop living in your shadow. They demonize you in a weak effort to discredit your divinity so that later they can look in the mirror without cursing themselves out. They don't hate you. If they did, they wouldn't study your music like interns studying medicine. They want to sing your blues without being black and blue. They want to feel what you feel when your bodies do things that according to physics are impossible. They want to siphon the joy out of your melanin so they can feel something and maybe be something other than paper dolls. They don't hate you. They know things about you. They can't ever afford to let you find out about yourself. They know that if they trust you with fairness, you'll leave them in the dust. They know if they lift a ban on color, your manhood will recover and change life as we know it on this planet. They don't hate you. They can't stand the internal strife of knowing they're missing something that you have in abundance. Something you have so much of, they can't steal it, dismember it, neutralize it, castrate it, misdirect it, or even breed it out of you. Which is why their desperation is so intense and deliberately aimed at duplicating your blackness and attaching it to their very own skin. They don't hate you. They hate themselves for adoring you for recognizing you, for failing to be like you, for not being superior to you, for not being able to replenish their race like you do. They hate themselves for worshiping you against their own will. But more than anything, they hate themselves for not being you. And the period goes right there. I do believe I'm reading the poem for the baby who just got here? Well, before you get to that poem, there was a special yeah. request. And um, if, you, if, you, if you're able to, um, Veronica asked if you could read The Night Something Precious Was Split Open. Do you have that? I didn't pull that book out. Okay, no worries. No worries. Sorry. And we need to talk, Gail. Okay. <laughs> okay. um so am i reading that yes the one for um the baby yes yeah this is very short very true it's called baby boy we used to have the guest and angst about the sex and shade of the baby but technology has robbed us of that wonder and now that we know it's a boy we sit anxiously awaiting his arrival Poised to read the future by the melanin in his knuckles. And now, an invitation to Blacknificence. Something is coming, something enormous, like a tsunami, but more instructive than destructive. Something is coming, y'all. Something spectacular like an earthquake, but more fantastic than catastrophic. Something is coming. 
something apocalyptic and ecliptic at the same time. Divine rumor has it that a deity certified by the creator to live a human existence is coming. Something heavenly has studied humanity and decided to bring all of its ashe to show us Africans the way. Something powerful has chosen a pair of extraordinary people to give it the breath it will need to lead us down the path of functional greatness. Someone prayed for, someone hoped for, someone longed for, someone dreamt about, someone sought after, someone inconceivable has been conceived. And we are waiting with bated breath for the malcolmized Imhotep of our blackest dreams. We are encircling his parents with Mau Mau protection, Kometian loyalty, Ma'atian justice, sweet honeyed rock harmony, and indestructible peace. We stand ready to receive him with the love and devotion prescribed by Dr. Wellson, demonstrated by Dr. Clark, and developed by Doc Ben. In the middle of all the chaos, orchestrated negativity, and deliberately designed malfeasance swirling around us, we stand ready to cradle this divine being in our hearts, to rock him with revolutionary fervor. We are the community who will receive the first blessings from his existence. And we pledge ourselves to his unlimited development, to hone his unconditional love for our creator, our earth, and our people. We will be his parents away from home, his teachers outside of school, the watchful eyes that monitor him on the streets, the genoich committed to molding his genius his North Star pointers towards inevitable leadership, his talisman against the dark arts, his direction when he's tempted to stray, his light workers constantly clearing his way. We look forward to bearing witness to his blossoming, to see how his personality integrates his mama's occasional retinence with his baba's usual gregariousness, to watch how he combines his baby's his Baba's entrepreneurial expertise with his mama's erudite scholarship. Like family members, we wonder if he'll have his mama's smile or his Baba's eyes. Will he be short and closer to the earth or tall and closer to heaven? Will he walk to the beats of hip hop or swag like the rhythms of Calypso? We can't wait to see what he does with the royal energy of his mama's crown and his Baba's scepter. Will he carry himself like an anointed one of biblical proportions or break out like Hannibal full of missions impossible? Will he follow the footsteps of Jednas of the past or machete a new trail for spiritual warriors of the present? Whatever gifts he's bringing, whatever wonders are at the core of his intentions, whatever his brilliance creates to reattach us to the gods we used to be, all we need to do is look at his parents and be assured that no matter what avenue he chooses, his life will be the source of miracles, the likes of which we have never seen. And for that, we lovingly point to his parents to say, Asante sana, adupwe, madasi pai. Yes, and Asante sana, madupe. Thank you, madasi for tonight's program, for your words, for hearing the call, hearing the, the, the ancestors, hearing and being connected to that divine infinite wisdom that comes through that you share with us, that you're able to pull down. Thank you so much, Mama Laini Mataka for this wonderful presentation, um, your wonderful poetry and this great, beautiful discussion. To Thank you, Mama, I have a question. Yes. You said we can see this again somewhere else at another time? Yes. And where where would I go to do that? Oh, I, I can tell I can tell you um Fine. yes. But it'll be on um YouTube. But, okay. Um, if I, I can share that, share with you how to get to that site. Okay. Um so yes, family, thank you all for coming out. I do want to invite you to our next Wisdom Wednesday program, which will take place on February 21st. It will feature Sister Ancosia X with her book entitled Play the Game, Hierarchical Assimilation. Um, that again will be on February 21st via Zoom, 7 to 9 p.m. This program, this Wisdom Wednesday, um, you will be able to find um, on our IKG YouTube page, IKGCulturalResourceCenter.com. We do want to 
remind you all about the, let's see, I wanna pull it back up. I wanna remind you all about the special that, um, that we're having, that Black Classic Press is having for Mama Laini books. It's King, it's, let me pull up the picture. I'm sorry, you all. I want to make sure I have the codes correct. Um, let me just find this image for you all. But while I'm pulling up the image, uh, Mama Laini, are there any closing remarks you would like to make? Write that chapter out of your life. Pick whatever chapter you, you want out of your personal life and write that chapter for the benefit of all that come after us, please. <laughs> and thank you so much. I appreciate this. I really do. Yes, a wonderful presentation. So I'm, I'm, you, I'm sure you see all of the comments coming through. Um, thanking you for um, for your for your presence tonight. I see. Ouch! 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 <laughs> <laughs> so here again, family is the flyer. Just want to make sure everyone can see this for tonight's attendee special uh, code. Um, if you all are having, I, I believe I saw a couple people mention they had a, a difficulty with the code. Um, I'm certain that Paul Coates is on the line and that he's hearing that and will make sure that the codes um, are are working. So just give us, um, just give them a little bit of time to um, to fix to adjust the code and to make sure this pops back up for you all. Oh, no, no. So it's King's Classic for $26 and King's Full for $45, which includes Return of the King's all right, so family, with that being said, I want to thank you all for coming out and I'm gonna wish you all a wonderful rest of your evening, week, month, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you again for coming out. Peace and blessings and love to all of you. Thank you. Yes, thank you.